sponsored by DCP Player, a simple way to view a DCP on any Windows-based PC. We've heard a lot of do's and don'ts about 3D, especially when 3D was starting to emerge the last few years as a, as a new cinematic language. Uh, what is your feeling as a filmmaker, since you've been right in the middle of it, in terms of the learning curve for 3D, and how difficult is it for a director that doesn't have any experience in 3D to start working within the medium? You know, I could spend two hours just busting the myths that are out there properly. There's so much sort of spurious information out there, and there are, there are a lot of so-called stereographers that, that basically just put that hat on and call themselves that because they knew they could command a, command a price that, that don't, that, you know, maybe haven't shot live-action movies in 3D or whatever. And, you know, there are, some of those myths are, uh, well, you have, to, you have to shoot differently. There's a fundamentally different cinematic language. And the answer to that is yes and no. Now, I didn't shoot Avatar any differently than all my other movies, you know, for 3D. Because I knew that it was going to be seen in 3D and 2D theaters. I knew it was going to be seen in 2D on, on DVD and Blu-ray. And that, that 3D, uh, you know, home video was still a ways away at the time that, we, that I was making all my creative decisions on that film. So I just, didn't, I just didn't do it differently. No, you can do it differently if you want to. You can shoot to absolutely optimize the 3D experience. And I think that at some point in the future when we really do have a true 3D ubiquity on all platforms around the world, people will, will feel completely free to do that or they can shoot the way they've always shot before. The point is you don't have to. You know, you don't have to change what you do as a filmmaker. Over the shoulder, still an over shoulder. Close up, still a close up. I mean, there are certain rules that have to be followed. They're very easy to, to, to learn. Quick the, cuts? Uh, quick cuts, that's, a, that's another myth that you can't quick cut. The last time I checked, Avatar was an action movie. And there was a lot of quick cutting in that movie. And, there's, and, and again, it's just there's a, there's a little tiny a bit of, of knowledge that you have to get. And if you're smart, you'll just hire people. Most, most directors are not directors of photography. They hire the knowledge they need in order to be able to light a shot or, or you know, do most of the cinematic things they're doing. Most directors are not editors. They hire an editor. So you, know, you, you make sure that you hire your camera team and you hire people that actually understand stereo and are going to keep you from, from doing things. But that should all be transparent. That should be happening behind the scenes. You should make all your creative decisions exactly as you would normally make them. And somebody back there is scrambling around adjusting the interocular distance and the convergence to make it all work. They're not telling you, you can't use this lens or you have to shoot on wide angle lenses or you, you can't pan the camera fast or you can't do this, you can't do that. The, the, the 3D people should be there to enable, to be yes people. Yes, I can do that. Yes, you want to do that? No problem. Um, and, you know, because I certainly didn't change the way I shot. I wasn't about to do that. And, and before I shot Avatar, I had to give myself uh, comfort that I wasn't going to have to change and that the film would not be compromised as a, as a 2D presentation, that it would only be value added. And that's the important thing about thinking about 3D. It always has to be thought of as value added. The second it starts to take away from the experience is the second that you should not make the 3D the most important thing you're doing. We're talking about the aesthetic decision making. And if you want to do a whole sequence of blizzard cuts that are 18 frames long, then yeah, back off your 3D a little bit because your 3D is not the thing that's carrying the ball at that point. What's carrying the ball is the, the kineticism of your sort of graphic filmmaking. And so it's, it's, I call it the hierarchies of perception. You know, you've got, you've got things that you perceive on, on different levels. And, and if, a shot is, if a shot is very involving in 3D, you might be aware of the 3D more. If things are happening really fast, you're less aware of the 3D. You don't need it as much. So you dial it in and out. You know, I think the issue now is that, that, that over the next couple of years, the cameras are going to get much smarter. They have to because what's happening right now is a content gap that's been introduced by the consumer electronics people introducing these gorgeous TV sets that allow you to watch TV in the home. And there isn't enough content coming into the home. We can't make movies fast enough to, to create the avalanche of content that's necessary to drive this new market. So what's going to fill that gap is sports and other live stuff, or near live, meaning, meaning maybe you know one hour and a half hour TV stuff that's posted in five days or eight days, something like that. They don't have time for conversion 
in that world. So conversion is really going to sunset more and more as a, as a viable 3D solution as you know, live and, and, and really short post stuff takes over and starts to fill that, fill that content gap. So yeah, so what will happen as a result of that is the camera systems need to be something you can just hand into a, to a, an NBA operator's hands and have them be able to shoot with like an hour of quick checkout. And so it all has to become more transparent. So the cameras will get smarter, they'll get smaller, they'll get lighter, they'll get more foolproof. You know, the thing is, like, like George has been saying, we're just in the first few years of this. We're the equivalent of, you know, the Wright brothers flew in 1903. We're about five, six years after that with, uh, with you know, uh, good uh, cinema quality uh, digital 3D camera system. So we're at what? You know, we're still, we're still flying, you know, biplanes with wires holding the, holding the wings together. Uh, so, uh, as, as George has said many times, there's so much headroom to improve with digital. So over the next couple of years, the cameras are going to start doing a lot of the thinking for people, and it's going to become so transparent to use that 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 you know it, there, there won't be that hesitation either the, on the aesthetic side or on the expense side. All right, so let's follow up on the conversion point. I just wanted to say one thing about what Jim was talking about, which is. When we were here before, I was pushing digital, and I wasn't—I didn't even thought about 3D. It wasn't in my lexicon. I wasn't a 3D guy. But Bob, like I said, Jim were big 3D guys, and I said we had a talk about coming to to this this convention, and uh, uh, and they said, well, it's a great way to push digital because you can't do 3D without digital. And I said, okay, so we converted some of Star Wars digitally. And when I saw it, I was very impressed with the fact that it's a different way of looking at a movie. It is really does help, and it especially helps aliens, but it really does create a 3D space. The example is we could never get Yoda, who was a puppet, to look like it lived in that 3D space, even though the digital version was way better. But the thing I realized, and when I saw Avatar on television and commercials, I said, well, that's just Star Wars. It's not going to go anywhere. It's the same thing we've already done. But when I saw it on the screen, and I saw it in 3D, I said, my god, it's real. The, the, the blue cats are actually real. I believe them completely. And it's because they're three, because you see that they're... You see they call them Thundercats. <laughs> <laughs> but when you look, when you look at, uh, over the shoulder, you believe that there's another side to it. You believe that they could turn around and there would be a person or a, a cat. So the, the, the issue, which, and Jim and I talked about this at the time, I said, the thing I loved about Star Wars and that thing, because it was converted, I said, there's no tricks. There's no, this is not a 3D movie. This is a movie in 3D. Everything happens behind the proscenium. And we talked and we agreed that's really the best way that that 3D should be, I and mean, it's pretty much Avatar is behind the proscenium, and that is why 3D is going to take over. 3D is like color. It's not like sound. Digital is like sound. Digital changes everything. Sound changed everything. Color just makes it better. And so now, when you're watching a movie, and it's not in 3D, and pretty soon as this becomes more and more popular, you're going to watch a, a regular movie and it's going to look like black and white. You're going to say, gosh, it's so much better. I really enjoy watching 3D movies. They're so much more real. They're so much more immediate. They're so much intimate. You know, I just like 3D better. And it's not because people are poking things at you. It's simply because it's a better way of looking at a film. It's more realistic and it gives you a better intimate relationship. So I totally believe now that, that ultimately 3D will completely take over, just as color is taking over. Yes, people will shoot films that aren't 3D, but eventually, just like color, it will eventually take over, and that's what everybody will do.